welcome to our second lecture of the 75th season of the Amos Fortune Forum. My name is Brad Smith and I will be your moderator for this evening's event. Let me start with just a few housekeeping items. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and anything else that might end up making some noise. I'll do the same. And uh, for the health of everyone in the building, we appreciate that you continue wearing your masks. It's, it's really helpful for everyone. Uh, these forum lectures remain free for everyone to attend. We would like to thank all of you who give to the forum, including a number of businesses in the area that have been so generous with their sponsorship. Please take note at each of the two exits. We have our begging bowls there, and uh, if you are so moved on the way out this evening, please feel free to, to, uh, to give. Our website, amosfortune.com, amosfortune, one word, is where you can find additional information about the forum, about our speakers, and about our schedule. You'll also find links to a recording of tonight's talk, as well as some of our previous lectures. We welcome your comments and suggestions as well. Uh, there should be small cards uh, that have been left on some of the seats. If you'd like to be added to our mailing list, we just fill it out and we'll be happy to, uh, to add you to the list. When the founders of the forum were planning this series of talks back in 1946, they decided that there would always be an arrangement of fresh flowers on the stage. In recognition of our 75th anniversary year this year, we'll have two arrangements each week, beautifully arranged by Bonnie Call of Call's Garden Center. And we would like to thank Rose. <laughs> We'd also like to thank Rosemary Putnam for sponsoring the flowers for tonight's lecture. After tonight's presentation, we hope you'll join us for a reception to meet the speakers and enjoy some light refreshments. So as you leave, follow the lanterns outside and walk across the parking lot to the First Church Parish House. It's the middle white wooden building. We'd like to thank Grace Hartman, Janice McKenzie, and Sue Conklin for organizing the reception following tonight's presentation. With that, our speakers tonight are Robert Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett. Among many other achievements, they recently collaborated on a book titled The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. Tonight, they'll share insights from their research on the book and challenge some of our assumptions about how stuck our society seems to be. Bob Putnam is no stranger to the Amos Fortune Forum. Uh, this is certainly not your first time speaking up here. He is the Malkin Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University and a former dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government. He's the author of over a dozen books, including Bowling Alone and Our Kids. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the British Academy. In 2006, he received the Skipta Prize. I probably butchered that. I don't know Swedish for the world. The world's highest accolade for a political scientist. In 2013, President Barack Obama awarded him the National Humanities Medal, the nation's highest honor for contributions to the humanities, for deepening our understanding of community in America. And in 2018, the International Political Science Association awarded him the Carl Deutsch Award for cross-disciplinary research. And if that weren't enough, he's received 16 honorary degrees from eight countries, including in 2018 from the University of Oxford. With his wife, Rosemary, who has given so much of her time to the Amos Fortune Forum, he splits his residency between Jaffrey and Cambridge. Shailen Romney Garrett, has an impressive resume as a writer and a social entrepreneur. After returning from the Peace Corps in Jordan, she co-founded and co-directed Think Unlimited, 
an international nonprofit organization working to provide educational programs to Jordanian youth to engage critically and creatively with their world. She's a founding contributor to Weave, the Social Fabric Project, founded by David Brooks and housed at the Aspen Institute. And her blog, Project Reconnect, seeks in her words to revitalize relationship and community in her own life and to help others get inspired to do the same. In 2011, Shaden was honored with the Draper Richards Kaplan Social Entrepreneur Fellowship. She was twice awarded a membership to the Clinton Global Initiative and has been a speaker at TEDx. Along with her husband and children, Shaden resides in nearby Keene. So, I hope I've made my case that our speakers know what they're talking about. <laughs> Given the incredibly dysfunctional cultural environment in which we all live, I'm certain their book and their remarks tonight are timely and will help us all see a brighter path forward. Please give Bob Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett a warm welcome to the Amos Fortune Forum. Um, uh, this is definitely, um, I'm home here in this, in this uh, building and in this uh, company. I see so many good personal friends here. Um, I'm going to speak first about this book and then Shayla will come along. And um, we're going to try to split the time. And we're going to try to follow Bob Woodward's, I'm sorry, Carl Bernstein's. <laughs> Don't tell him I'm going to say. Carl Bruce is exactly what I think of leaving more than the usual time for a few days. I thought that would be really well. Um, but then we have to speak really fast. And I can speak really fast. And I'm going to have to go quickly over my part of the uh, talk. If we could have the next slide, I see I'm standing in the picture. Can we have the next slide? Could we have the next slide? Um, well, I'll just tell you the next slide says while he's getting up. Uh, let's see if we can get it all the way onto the screen, the full screen. That's the right one, but can you just make that cover the full screen? Perfect. No, back one, back one now. Well, you can stay there. Stay there. Um, it, the first, the basic point is America's in a pickle. Have you noticed America's in a pickle? <laughs> Actually, the only thing we all agree on is that America's in a pickle. Um, but I'm going to try to more specific about that. Um, we're in a pickle in four very specific and apparently unrelated ways. Um, and we are unbelievably polarized politically. Carl uh, Rossi last week talked a lot about that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to do it in shorthand. The best evidence is that the only time in our whole national history in which we've been as polarized politically as we are now was between 1860 and 1865. I do not mean that we're now on the verge of a civil war. I don't actually know. I don't think it'll look like the last time we had a civil war. But we are deeply, deeply polarized. Secondly, and apparently unrelated to that, we're amazingly unequal. The gap between rich folks, folks and poor folks in America, economically, is about as great as it's ever been in American history. There's one possible exception to that. I'm going to talk about that more. But we, it's just astonishing. Relative to our own past, we're really, really unequal as a society in, in, in economic terms. Thirdly, and also independently, seems like it's not related, we are unbelievably un... It's hard to find a time in our history when we have been as socially isolated from one another as we are now. It's a little harder to mention this. I'll show you some numbers that will try to show you how incredibly socially isolated we have become. And not least, maybe the most important, we are the most self-centered we have ever been. The culture of America today, and I'm, sure, I'm not just, you know, I believe in data, as, as many of you know, I really believe in data. I'm going to show you some evidence that our culture has rarely ever been as meat-focused, as narcissistic, as it is now. And the question we 
Well, lar the larger question, I'm just going to do the data presentation here. I'm just going to show you the evidence that, that what I just said is true. Um, and I'm going to do that very briefly. Because the more important question is, so what? What do we do about this? And that's the point at which I'll hand the baton to Shailene and let her talk about a little bit more about the narrative. How we got here and how we could get out of where we are now. Because in the end, this is a talk that's meant not to just be a social science look at American history talk. It's meant to be a talk that will help us figure out what we can do as a country to get out of this pickle. So we have the next slide, please. Okay, all the charts. Um, by, by the way, I know some people in the world are numbers people and some people are not. If you're a numbers person, this is your time. If you're not a numbers person, just, you know, close your eyes, close off a little bit. If he, if, he, if he gets anything interesting, something your next door neighbor will alert you. So this is these, this is the numbers part of the story. And what it shows is that all these charts, I'm not going to show that many charts, and they're all going to have exactly the same form. The horizontal axis is time. So here is America in 1900. Can you see that all right? And here is America um, today, or here is America today, 2023. Um, and the vertical axis is going to be a measure of one of those four things I just, just talked about. I'm starting with political polarization. And we have many different measures. This is the part where I'm going to go quickly because I just don't have time to talk about exactly how we measure this, but you'll just have to trust me. For each of these variables, we have nearly a dozen different indicators that all tell the same story. So. I am really, I'm really confident that the, what I'm about to describe to you is, a, is factually accurate. America began, at the, at the end of the 19th century, America was incredibly polarized politically. Our politics was essentially tribal in that period. And there was basically no one thought about, is it a good idea to cooperate with somebody from the other side of the aisle? Because nobody did. And everybody, hated people on the other side of the political spectrum, and they they all voted the same ticket. If I'm a Democrat, I'm going to vote for Democrat for dog catcher and president and everything else. That's how polarized politically we were. And as you can see, that began to change a little bit in the first decade of the 20th century. That's 1900, that's 1910. It begins to go up. We're still awful polarized, but moving a little bit in a less polarized direction, and you can see that year by year, steadily, every year we got a little, a little more cooperative politically, a little less polarized, a little more trusting and willing to collaborative, work a little to work across party lines. That trend goes essentially in a straight line, up, up, up. This is through the New Deal and through the World War II, but it actually just keeps going even after World War II. Up here, a few people in the audience will remember a president named Dwight Eisenhower. This is a period when he was president. And historians agree that Dwight Eisenhower was the least partisan president in American history, except for George Washington. And he symbolized that. He didn't cause that era, but he symbolized how. And then, here we are in the, in the new frontier, and it's still awfully awfully lots of collaboration across party lines, but it's, the trend is now going in a slightly different direction, and that trend keeps going down, 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 for, well, by now, it's 50 years of increasing polarization. And here I link, as I will, as we will several times during the, these, these remarks, um, link um, quickly, to Carl's, Carl Bernstein's uh, talk last week. You'll remember he said, really polarization in America is not about Donald Trump. He's a latecomer to the story. And you can see that right here. Here's where Donald Trump enters our, our national politics. We'd all believe him. Donald Trump is a kind of a symptom of something that had been underway for 20 or 30 years before he even thought about politics. So that's the trend in, that's what the graph looks like for political polarization, I'm going to be a little, even quicker in talking about the next three graphs. Let's have the next shot slide, please. Okay, good. This is about uh, economic 
equality, an economic inequality, and it's measured in many different ways. We use income different, the gap between rich and poor in terms of income or in terms of wealth, before taxes, after taxes, the likelihood that kids can move from the bottom of the hierarchy to the top of the, top of the hierarchy economically, um, the, well, many, many, many different measures of inequality. They all tell the same story, and they tell the story that at the beginning of the 20th century here, this day begins in, 19, in 1914, because that's when the IRS was invented. So that's when we have really good, serious, hard data. But we know from less ironclad good data what it looked like before. It was even lower back here. Um, that is, um, equality was lower back here. Inequality was higher. Um, and so then, in the, the little bit in the, in the decade of the 1910s, began to get a little more equal. This period right here is the um, uh, period of the 1920s, the roaring 20s, when rich folks got richer and poor folks got poorer. But even before the Depression hit, equality started moving in the, in the right direction. We're still very, very unequal here. But the trend is a little bit in the right direction before the New Deal, notice. And, and, yet, and then it continues going up every year, almost every year. The country's a little more equal in terms of, and it's true for Democrats. When Democrats are in power, it's true when Republicans are in power. Um, it's, it's accelerating, you can see this period here, it's accelerating during, Eis during Eisenhower's years. America became more equal, um, and then it dipped a little bit in, when, the, when the Kennedys came into, when Jack Kennedy came into power, but then by the 1980s it had begun to plunge. And once again, America is becoming less equal. Every year, virtually every year of the last half century, and then you might say, well, okay, we stopped the story here in, in, um, in 2014 or something like that. That was the end of the Obama period. And so maybe we finally finished this, you might say, because, you know, it's beginning to bottom out. But if you continue the data here, and we all know what happened here, the, ta the, the uh, Trump tax cuts and the, and the virus meant that by now that number is down here. I, don't, I know what the number is, I just don't have it on the graph because the, the book was published before all those things happened. So now we're, right now, we're about as unequal as a country as we have ever been. Close call is the, is the uh, period of the, um, uh, back, back here, which was called the Gilded Age, and it was called the Gilded Age because of the gap at, at that point between the rich folks on the Upper East Side and the poor folks on the Lower East Side. Um, let's have the next slide, please. This is a similar chart for social cohesion, the degree to which we connect what I have sometimes academically called social capital, but the measures here is, are quite, they're, they all tell the same story, but they're very different. One is how, how well connected our families are, one is how well connected our communities are, one is um, how, well, you know, how connected we are in religious congregations, um, another is uh, how much we're, how active we are, we are involved in, in groups just like this. This is a great example of social capital. Um, and in fact, as you might want to know, I can tell you later what the data look like, Manhattan, the Manhattan region where we live is statistically speaking probably the highest level of social capital in America. So I'm not I'm not trying to curry favor with you. What I'm trying to say is we all live in a bubble in which in our little bubble we're not as polarized as the rest of America. We're certainly not as disconnected. We're not we're not even as unequal as the rest of America. Don't think of the Nadia as being typical. It isn't. It's the extreme opposite of the rest of America. Um, and you can see what the graph looks like. Um, and now I guess more to go through this all. Beginning at the end of the at the end of the 19th century, we were very connect, disconnected from our family in all the ways that I mentioned. That begins to still very disconnected here, but we're moving in the right direction. There's that pause in the 1920s, and then it keeps going up, up through World War II. Probably the greatest civil boom in American history is in the 1940s, 1950s. Every group in America was doubling its members. It was hard to believe, actually. Um, and none of 
none of us would have been uh, parents of that period, but all of us, many of us, would have been students. And in that period, the PTA was growing unbelievably. Every year, millions more Americans joined the PTA. I'm using that as an example. But then suddenly, silently, mysteriously, all of those groups all over America stopped you know, began to lose members. And, and, and uh, marriage, which had reached its peak here in the baby movement, it began to decline a little bit. And social trust, which is a very good example, very good measure of this, social trust was in this period about, I'm doing this for memory, but in that period right there, about 70% of Americans said they trusted it, other people to do the right thing. And a standard question has been asked thousands of times by now. Last week, that number was 17%. 70% to 17%. That's here to here. Let's have the next chart. Uh, this is a measure of social, social, of cultural solidarity in the sense that we're all in this together. Actually, we buy the book and read the book. Because I'm so proud of this, how we measured this, but I don't have time to explain. But it's essentially a measure of the sense in which we feel that we're all in this together, or we're not. And in this period, Shane will say a little bit more about this. In this period, Americans basically thought we were all in it for ourselves, and, and that's the way it should be. We all organize a society in which everybody looked after themselves and nobody worried about their neighbor or their fellow man, um, that changed dramatically here and grew so that in, in one sense, in this period, America was very much an I society. Everything was focused on I, me. But over the course of this first half of the 20th century, we became more and more convinced that we were all in this together. And we all had an obligation, a moral obligation, to worry about other people. We had become a we society. You see what I mean when I use the term we society? And what happened right here, you can see it very clearly in the data, in the, in the, middle, in the middle of the 1960s, that turned sharply. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time, and now we're back in an extremely I society. So we've been through a cycle from an I society to a we society to an I society. And you're probably going to want to, want to know, well, what happened up there that caused this to sh shift? And we're not going to talk very much about that for reasons Sherry will explain. But actually, I know the answer. I will share it with you. I personally, personally first started to vote right there. And as soon as I began taking part in public life in America, America collapsed. Um, <laughs> Social trust went down, and we became a, an I society. I don't, as a good social scientist, I will look for many other possible explanations, but that, the data, it's, it's what social scientists call, um, it, it's a truth that passes the interocular, interocular trauma test. It hits you between the eyes that there's something happening here. And that's true for all these guys. Let's look at the next chart, and you'll see what I mean. Next chart? No, that's not the next chart. Don't but please, that's not the next chart. How about we get the next chart? Uh, yeah, okay, that's it. That, I'll, I'll take with this one, that's fine. Okay, good. I put all those charts together. I could easily do that because they were all the same chart. You see what I mean? And here we, and we call this the I, we, I curve. And um, it, it's, a, or the measure of the, this one huge um, swing, it's not actually a pendulum, but it's one huge swing of American society and economics and politics and culture from being highly individualistic over there to being quite communitarian and worried about community and equal and cooperative and so on and trusting to now being back over there. Um, I'm going to pass the, if we have the next slide, I think this is the point which I'm going to pass the, huh? Okay, chin in. The question is, what does all this mean? 
she's the gal who's going to tell you how to work with So if you closed your eyes before because you're not a numbers person, now is the part where you're going to want to open them up again. I'm not a numbers person either, and we think this is what makes us such a great team, is that I'm more of a storyteller, so I'm going to tell you what this all means. Now, there's a couple of ways that you could look at this chart. Let me start off by saying we're not the first people, we're not the first scientists or the first commentators or the first journalists to ask the question that we started this presentation with, with which is how did we get here? Many studies have been done trying to answer the question, what's going on? How did America end, end up in this multifaceted crisis? In fact, one of the early reviewers of our book said, this is just yet another addition to the how America got into this mess genre of literature. <laughs> For about the past 10 years, we've been puzzling over trying to explain what's going on right in our news in our country. And we think that there's a couple ways in which our study is a little bit different than others that have been, or other theories or other studies that have been out there. First of all, there are a lot of people that focus on this downturn, trying to explain a fall from race in America. And that's an important story. What happened that turned us in this negative direction? But we think actually that the moment that we have the most to learn from as a society is not the moment when we were at a peak and things began to turn down. On the contrary, we believe the moment that we have the most to learn from is the moment that most looks like the one we're living in, which is actually here. By all of these different measures, scores of different measures, and it's hard if you're not a data person to really understand the magnitude of what Bob has presented to you. It's extraordinarily rare in the social sciences to have this many independent variables tracking the same trajectory over such a long period of time. It's a very rare finding. Very clear that something is going on here. So by scores of different measures, we are living through a second American Gilded Age. Oftentimes that, that term is thrown around to describe the fact that we are equally, economically unequal to the last golden age. But it turns out to be true in all these other ways too. And one of the ways that the last Gilded Age was so similar to what we're living through today was there were all these commentators decrying the end of democracy. The American experiment has failed. We've descended into tyranny and plutocracy. All is lost. These doomsday prophecies of what America was going to experience after this moment. But none of those prophecies turned out to be true. Because right on the heels of that dark moment in American history, we entered into an upswing, a multifaceted, multi decade movement when everything started year upon year in almost every category of American life getting better and better and better. Many of you in this room lived through part of this upswing. You might remember what it felt like to live in an America where year upon year we were more and more optimistic about the future of our nation. That's harder for people in my generation to imagine because I was born here. The only thing that I've experienced has been darkness succeeded by more and more darkness. But we have the opportunity to learn from this moment when America righted the ship, we turned it around. The question is not how can we make America great again, how can we get back to some supposed golden age of history, but rather how can we learn from the last time we saw an upswing in this nation. So what we're going to talk about for the last portion of this presentation are some lessons from the last upswing. So if we could go to the next slide. I just want to highlight the period. The period of American history that came right on the heels of the last Gilded Age was called the Progressive Era. And I want to make sure that it's clear, when I'm using the term progressive in a historical sense, we're talking about the period from about 1900 to 1915 in American history, we are using that term differently than it's used today. Today we might um, hear the term, what we would like to call small p progressivism, which describes the leftmost end of the political spectrum. That's not what this progressive era was. The progressive era was characterized by capital P progressivism, which was a bipartisan movement, a movement historians have called so diverse as to be barely coherent. 
It was something that captured the imagination of the entire country and began to change almost every aspect of our society. So what was that progressive era? What was it characterized by? And what can we learn from it? Now, as Bob indicated, the story in our book is a very data-based story. So we got a lot of variables, and they're all moving. And a lot of times when you're looking at change over time, and you're looking at lots of different variables that move in the right direction, roughly at the same time, you might say to yourself, well, which one of the things started moving in the right direction first? If we can identify the leading variable, we might be able to know what thing we should focus on in order to get everything moving in the right direction. And we have a bit of a bias in American culture. We tend to believe that economics drives everything, and the rest is just sort of details. The idea being that if we could get moving in the direction of economic equality, well, that would probably lead to less polarization, and we'd all get along better and want to hang out together more, and those other things would begin to change. So you might look at this and say, well, probably the leading variable was economic equality. That probably started to change first. What we know from the data is actually that that's not true. The one thing that's clear when we look at all this data is that economics was a lagging variable. It was the last thing to change. Now, don't mishear me. I am not saying that it's not important to fix our economic inequality. I am saying that there may be some other factors or phenomena underneath our economic system that we have to get at and change first. And that's exactly what happened in this progressive era. Because when you look at all of those data points, what becomes clear is that what changed first was culture. America experienced a cultural and moral awakening during the progressive era. It started very early on, even during the Gilded Age, when people began to say, from a moral perspective, enough is enough. America has gone off the rails. Now, the Gilded Age culturally was characterized by something called social Darwinism. A few decades earlier, Charles Darwin had articulated the survival of the fittest, which was a description from his perspective of how the natural world works. So a lot of social commentators came along and said, well, if that's how the natural world works, it's just a giant competition and only the strong will survive, well, then that must be a good way to organize human society as well. Only the strong will survive, the dead will take the hindmost. Into that cultural milieu came something called the social gospel movement. It was a movement initially led by evangelical pastors, theologians who began to read Christian scripture and say, wait a minute, we're doing this all wrong. We are getting our own morality wrong. At the time, Christianity was characterized by a very individualistic, very self-focused um, idea of salvation. It's about my personal sins and my personal relationship with God, and what everybody else is doing is none of my business. And these theologians came along and said, no, it's clear right here in the Gospels that what is being called for is a social morality, that we are responsible for how we structure our society. And that started in Christianity, it began to catch on more broadly throughout our country, and we had a vast moral awakening when Americans just said, enough is enough. The energy of that moral awakening led this shift into an upswing. Because we began to rethink everything. We began to rethink, as a nation, how we organized our economic systems, how we organized our politics, how much we were willing to cooperate as opposed to compete. Another lesson of this era was that the people who were energized by this moral awakening were very young. If you think in your mind, do I know any famous progressives? You might think of Jane Addams or Theodore Roosevelt, or you might think of Francis Perkins or Paul Harris, who founded the Rotary Club, or um, Ida B. Wells, who was a famous muckraking journalist. To a person, every single one of those people that I've named was under the age of 30 when they were doing the most important work to engineer an upswing in this country. This was a movement led by the young. America was completely changed from what it had been a generation ago. We had just gone through the Industrial Revolution. Millions of Americans had moved out of small towns and off of farms and into big, bustling cities. Life was unrecognizable to the generation that preceded these young progressives. 
Does that sound familiar today? <coughs> These young people were innovative. They could imagine a future that didn't exist yet, and they began to create the civic, political, and economic systems that would bring us into that future. So we believe today that if we are going to see another upswing, it's probably not going to start with economic policy. It's probably going to start with a revolution of the heart. And it will be led by our young innovators. Something that these young progressives really understood was the power of association. They were really interested in bringing people together. Association is kind of an antiquated term. Um, we might use a term like connection or community or relationship today. Association is the word they would use for it, but they were building new ways of bringing people together. The quilting bees and the barn raisings that were enough to bring their parents' communities together weren't going to cut it on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And so Paul Harris, who came from a small town in New England, moved to Chicago to be a lawyer. He was just lonely. He didn't know anybody in Chicago, and he invited three professionals to start having lunch with him. And out of that grew an association that became the Rotary Club. And over time, it was like, oh, we not only can assuage our own loneliness, but we can begin to be a force for good in the world. And Rotary transformed into something that was a social club into one of the largest service organizations in the world. As Bob mentioned, this was a time of an intense civic boom. There were new ways of bringing people together being invented left and right. Today, we have to do the same thing. We have to prioritize connecting, particularly across lines of difference, to rebuild and reweave the social fabric that has come unraveled. Again, if you know anything about progressive history, you might think to yourself, yeah, I don't know progressivism. That was what brought us the income tax and child labor laws and the Consumer Protection Agency and a bunch of constitutional amendments and all of these top-down changes. This must have been a movement that was engineered as a top-down way to change the country. Turns out that that's not the, the case at all. The story of progressivism was that it was bottom-up first. It was all about grassroots citizen activism. People working in towns the size of Jack Green, New Hampshire, and cities the size of Keene, looking at the problems on their own doorstep and saying, how can we band together to solve this problem? As opposed to looking to Washington, to solve the problem for them. Eventually, the best ideas went viral and then bubbled up and became models for federal programs that changed the face of the country. But they didn't start at the federal level, they started in towns just like this. If we're going to see another upswing, it's going to come from groups like those sitting right in this room today, not from our politicians who are sitting in the halls of power. There was charismatic political leadership involved in the progressive era. You might have heard a guy named Teddy Roosevelt, right? One of the most successful political entrepreneurs in American history. He saw a parade and got out in front of it and created, you know, some, he created compromise at a national level and was able to bring people together at the level of creating, you know, a new political party. We will need that kind of change, but it isn't going to start there. So if we're looking for a leader who's going to save us, we're not going to find him or her until we create the change from the bottom up. Now there are lots of lessons. I've, I've talked about these progressives as though they, as though they were these amazing saviors of America. And by, by the data, you can see that they really did right the ship in hard, measurable ways. But when we look at this period of history, there are also some cautionary tales. Not everything that they did was right. Not everything that they did was perfect. Not everything that they did left a legacy of positive change. And I don't have time to go through all of these with you today. We're out of time, and we do want to get to questions. But I will just highlight one particularly important lesson from this era. And that's this. The circle of moral concern that most progressives were working within did not extend to people of color, and to a certain extent, not to women as well. And as has happened multiple times in the history of this nation, the needs of people of color were sacrificed on the altar of progress. We'll get around to including everyone later. If we try to include everyone now, it'll never get done. Have we heard that before? The lesson from this mistake is that much of the structural racism that is built into our nation today is the legacy of not doing the work then to make the we we were building toward fully inclusive. We cannot make that mistake again. 
leaving the work of racial reconciliation for another generation. We've made that mistake too many times in this country and we can't do it again. So the we that we were building toward during that episode was an imperfect we in many ways. But nonetheless, we can see a model. We can learn from history. We won't recreate everything that the progressives did and we wouldn't want to. But there are many ways in which we can look to their legacy to find a roadmap for where we need to go today. If we can just go to the last slide, I'll leave you with this thought. Can we just go to the next can slide? Next slide. Thank you. Wrong direction. Let's go. We're looking for the Teddy Roosevelt quote. Backward. There we go. All right. I'll leave you with this parting thought. Teddy Roosevelt said this. The fundamental rule of our national life, the rule which underlies all others, is that in the end, and in the long run, we shall go up or down together. In order to elucidate this idea further, I'd like to quote one of my colleagues, Eric Lee, who says, we all do better when we all do better. The data is painfully clear that this is true. When we are focused on I and me, everyone suffers. And when we are focused on we, everyone prospers. We have been in a mess just as ugly, just as difficult, just as hard, just as complicated as the one that we are living in today. If there's one message that we want you to walk away from this talk with, it is this. We've been here before. It's easy to look at our problems today and say, oh my gosh, it's never been this bad before. It has. In measurable ways, we can prove that it has, and we fixed it. We did it once before, and we can do it again. But we're going to have to start in places that might be unfamiliar. Places of the heart. Places of connection. Places of relationship. It's there that we are going to find a way to reweave the social fabric that will become the fabric of our next upstate. We hope that this has been a little bit of hope and inspiration for you in a really dark time. And we're really looking forward to taking your questions. Thank you so much for having us. On the uh, left side of the rising bell curve, there were two world wars. World War One, World War Two. What was the impact of those on the collective psyche of America? Um, good question. Answer: um, Very little of this story is about World War Two. Um, you can see in the data a little bit of the fact of World War Two. None of World War One. A little bit of World War Two. Um, but I can back with there. The graph that been going up toward we for 25 years before World War II. So World War II usually causes have to come before their, their, the the effects, and, and it can't be 25 years before the war. People were saying, "Well, we better start cooperating because 25 years from now we're going to have war." That and it also much longer. Remember this for from 45 to. At least 65, so at least roughly through a quarter century after the war, we were still going up. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm trying to say in terms of. Yes, no? Who, who, who was asking? Yeah. I'm sorry, I had the wrong person asking the question. So you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Thanks. Could you comment on the same thing around 9 11? I would, I would, just being 50 years old, I. I would expect to see some coming together yep. about 9-11. Uh, my research team did also expect that. Uh, and therefore, we, 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 were, we had America wired at that point. We were taking surveys and so on every, every couple of weeks in that period. And therefore, I can tell you with great certainty, there was an upswing around 9-11, and it lasted six weeks. <laughs> That's the facts. Some connection and some disconnection is technology. Yeah. 
Yeah. How do we think about that with the things we don't do? Great question. So the question was about technology. That's clearly different today than it was in the last skilled age. Yes and no. It might seem like an obvious thing that, that the technological change today just makes everything totally different. However, in that period, we forget that we saw the introduction of the telephone. We saw the introduction of railroads that, that completely upended American life. And it's hard to think that there's a comparison between how it felt to experience that disruption, that technological disruption. But it is parallel. When you look at the when you look at the lived history, the people who went through this period, they have that same sense of dislocation. Like, like technology is up in everything. And we don't know how to function anymore in our society. So it's more similar than you think. That being said, we do have a little something called social media today, which um, influences this in a major way. And, and the question is how to grapple with social media in in this context, right? Um, and I couldn't say more about that. I don't want to necessarily hijack this Q&A, but I do think that that is something that is extraordinarily different, particularly social media as a means for disseminating disinformation. Um, and that is one of the biggest needs that we have for innovation. I'm not a digital native. I might look young, but I did not grow up with a cell phone. I didn't get one until I graduated from college. Even I feel a little bit out of my gap in the technological world. This is why we need our youngest people who are digital natives. They will be the ones who will innovate around how we are going to tame the use of social media with their mind. So thank you for that. Yes. Just to just add the two brief things to everything uh, I agree with everything Shannon said. Um, uh, once upon a time, uh, people thought maybe the internet would fix the problem, that, uh, and, and then now, later, people think maybe the internet caused the problem. It certainly did not cause the problem. These trends were going down when Bill Gates was in diapers. So the internet did not cause this. Is the internet making it worse, or maybe it better? That's a harder question. Um, I think there are ways in which it could make things better. But it's not guaranteed, and that, I'm going to, forgive me, I'm going to make an, another more general point that I think we would like to make. There is no technological or um, historical imperative that impels things to go in a particular way. We, strong, our evidence strongly convinces us in what academics sometimes call agency. That is, we're not the playthings of technology or of the way of history. We can make a difference. It was not guaranteed that those people 125 years ago go and fix it. It happened because they did something, not because it was the right time for getting together or whatever. And the same thing is true with technology. I don't think technology is going to either guarantee that things are going to get better or guarantee that things are going to get worse. It depends on what we decide to do. And I mean we as people, but also I mean we as the government. It, our society has the capacity to make technology a friend of progress or an enemy of progress. Yes, sir. Could you comment on the proliferation of grassroots bridge organizations, National Institute of Civil Discourse, One America, we, uh, Braver Angels, which is an entity that I'm very much involved with, and how you see them moving, uh, helping us to move to this we, that you're talking about. Yeah, I know Bob is dying to say something. No, I'm not. I'm just trying to say that is the biggest, fattest softball you could possibly yeah. have yeah. played. <laughs> She's so the one. We're going to find out who gets to answer that question because we love it so much. Um, so, so, did everyone hear this gentleman's question, more or less? He, he asked to comment on the new movement in our country called the Civil Discourse Movement, um, which really is a grassroots, bipartisan, to a certain extent, bipartisan movement um, whose sole aim is to bring people into conversation with one another across lines of difference. And there are a hundred different flavors of this happening all over the country. He mentioned a few of the very best. Um, my favorite is also Braver Angels, which is an entirely grassroots, 
chapter-based organization that is committed to being 50% red, 50% blue at absolutely every level of their organization. So this is not a bunch of Democrats going out and saying, we really need to get some Republicans in the room with us, or vice versa. This is people 50-50 split down the middle in terms of their political affiliations who believe that we have to talk to each other. And they have organized tools and forums and training for how to make this happen in your own living room, not just in your own community, in your own living room. And the stories of transformation that are coming out of this movement where people who couldn't talk to each other but then were led through a facilitated process to sit down with one another in the same room, the stories of transformation are really incredible. This is exactly what the progressives did. When I said association as an end of means, that was just a fancy way of saying we've got to get people in the room talking to one another. So go and search on the internet for the Listen First project. It's an umbrella organization that's bringing all of these different opportunities together. You can search for what's happening in your community. You can bring something that's not happening yet in your community. And Braver Angels is one that I would highly recommend. If you're, if you're particularly concerned about political polarization, that would be the one I would recommend to start with. But there are also ones that are much more casual, bringing people across lines of difference just in the conversation over a meal. This is probably the most important work that we can possibly do right now. Because as I like to say, Social media is all about disinformation at moments, but the best way to fight disinformation is relationship. Knowing other people who are different than you and realizing they're not what this demonized version that gets put out there, they're not that. So thank you for bringing that up because that's fantastic. Uh, in the back, of, yes, you, in yeah. front of the pillar. Um, I just wonder, you, you, this year, Problem areas that create uh, disharmony in our and you race to the you race to the race issue of black African Americans. Uh, but you, the Spanish speaking people in this country are a larger group that are, are uh, have many biases against them. Uh, you've got uh, women that represent uh, 50, over 50 percent of the population that are not black women. Uh, uh, a week a week ago. Yeah. So I mean, the blacks make up twelve percent of the population. But you know, I'd say aren't there more bigger bigger groups that are penalized and should be brought in? So did you hear the question? The question is, we talked about uh, blacks as a minority that was left out the last time, but we didn't talk about women, um, which is a much larger group. And there's there. Um, several reasons why we left that out, actually. Uh, first of all, there is a chapter in our book entirely devoted to gender. That's the first point. We didn't leave it out of the story, we did leave it out of the talk. The reason we left it out of the talk was, frankly, that the growth of the movement of our country towards, uh, towards um, a greater gender equality um, has been essentially linear for the last 200 years. Women have been making progress compared to men over nearly the last two centuries. It's a very important development. I cheer it. Um, Rosemary and I, our daughter, who stayed with us actually, she's just a couple of miles from here now, is a, is a serious professional woman, a commentator, and a professor, and so on, and I would be unbelievably upset if she didn't have those opportunities. So I'm, but it's not that that somehow, un, that, that, that happened only after, say, the Women's Revolution of 1960. It's, it's a complicated story, but I'm going to try, at the risk of, of, of being misunderstood, I'm going to try to give the short version. Um, the women's movement in the 1960s, I, I'm conscious of what I'm saying, was basically a momentary blip of a in a trend toward greater female equality that has and measured however you measure it in terms of education or in terms of income or in terms of working outside the home, lots of different measures we've looked at. Had that had, women's progress has been steady for a long time, 
and particularly with respect to education, women are now and always have been better educated than men. That's been true for at least 150 years. Pardon? I'm sorry, take your, mouth, take your mask off so I can hear you. We're, okay, so I, I was, I should have not, um, I don't want to get, I, this is not an honor I want to have, but it is true that the women who didn't go and then do go to Harvard and Yale are a tiny fraction of all women. The, the Harvard and Yale is not a representative of American society. Women have been, um, going to good schools, good secondary schools and good um, universities, colleges and universities, in higher rates than men for a very long time. I, and I, there are a lot of, and in, okay, well, I, that's the facts. Um, so I, I don't want to, I'm conscious of running over time, and I'm conscious now of having, um, gotten into a hornet's nest that probably we're not going to be able to resolve can I add, immediately. Can I add a thought here? Yeah. Is that, you know, I think um, when we talk about the question of inclusion, one thing that comes up is who's at the center deciding who gets to be included, right? And I think that that's actually what the hunger for change is today. That we're finally sort of standing up and realizing, like, there have been a, there has been sort of a group at the center deciding who gets to come in and when. And I think that the hope of this rising generation, the most diverse generation in American history, they have a totally different conception of what that could look like. They are, they're coming at this question of what the American we looks like with much more innate sense of inclusion. Instead of a sense that we have to actively, the, the, whoever is in the we has to actively go out and include the people who are not. And I think one of the most hopeful things about, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement is the centering, that's, that's a word we hear a lot, the centering of the experience of historically excluded groups, as opposed to letting that be on the periphery of this we all the time. And that's one of the things that I think is most hopeful about the conversations about race and gender that are beginning to happen in our society. I agree they're not happening fast enough and that, and that we all have a role to play in, in creating that change. Because even though what Bob says is true, that the story of women's inclusion has been essentially moving in this direction linearly, it has not been nearly fast enough. And that's a fact that we can all agree on. And that's partly because women have been on the outside of the conversation being invited in at the convenience of others. And I think the rising generation realizes that that model no longer works. And for me, that's where the hope of what the new American we could look like comes from. Yeah. Uh, over here. Last question. Oh, last question. Last question. Um, I want to talk about churches. I was intrigued by your comment that the first upswing was led by progressive theologians because yeah. it was a cultural moral. Where's the hope for that now when uh, I'm a pastor? Progressive. I preach in a mainline church doing pulpit supply around the Monadnock region, usually to 30 people. Sure. Now in the afternoon, the church that aligns with right wing politics will come in with a very large drum set and preach to several hundred. Those are the louder voices. Where's the hope for the progressive theologians today? Uh, or do we just, is that not where it's going to come from? You probably both want to say something about yeah, like yeah. it. So you go ahead and then I'll, so, I'll say something. So um, here's the thing that we have to remember. We are at a really low point on all of these measures. And what we are looking for today is not to suddenly skyrocket back up to that peak, we are looking for a pivot. Think in your mind physically what a pivot looks like. A pivot looks like you're standing in the same place. But before you were facing this direction, 
and now you've chosen to orient your energy in this direction. So the changes that we are looking for start subtly. And for me, your specific answer to your question about where is the hope for churches, I think there's a massive reckoning happening within evangelical Protestantism today. We don't instantly see the change, but we see the reckoning. And we happen to know because we've advised the, um, the board of the, Nas- the National Even- Association of Evangelicals, for example. We've spoken at lots of Christian colleges and universities. There's a huge appetite for this message, even amongst evangelical Protestants, because they are in an active battle for the soul of their denomination. Evangelicalism in this country was very nearly taken, the leadership of evangelicals um, in this country was very nearly taken over by left wing leaning people and, and excuse me, right wing um, extremists, and they managed to stave that off literally just like six months ago. They're in an active battle. The leadership of, that, of, of, of this um, type of Christianity in America is in the midst of soul searching. And so there's hope there for me. There's no, we don't know what the outcome of that's going to be yet. But there are voices within that part of Christianity that are really calling for change. Uh, I just want to be quick that this is the ultimate meme drop. Uh, last month I was talking to uh, uh, Pope Francis. And <laughs> did that do it? That was a true story. <laughs> Pope, Pope Francis is inviting the Vatican to talk about these kinds of issues. Um, and Pope Francis is, I have to say, not, from my point of view, not good on abortion. But on the issues of equality and polarization and immigration and the environment, I know this part we all know this from what he says, but I know I'm talking to him personally. He is trying to lead a very bureaucratic organization to make that pivot. He's not going to be successfully walking down that path, but that's the that's what the pivot will look like in the in the Catholic Church. I just had to talk about it. <laughs> well, I don't think we're going to top that, so it's probably time to end. Uh, Bob and Shaylin, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us tonight. It's with gratitude that the Amos Fortune Forum continues our tradition and presents you each with a half gallon of maple syrup. All right. Uh, I just want to add that Toadstool has uh, the upswing. Uh, you can head over to Peterborough tomorrow and uh, pick up a copy. Um, we also invite you to join us next week uh, for a talk on the Rosenberg case, still current in 2022, given by Robert Mirapool. So uh, please, I hope you enjoyed tonight's lecture. Join us across the way for a reception. We can continue the discussion and questions and, and responses. And uh, for COVID reasons, please wear your masks and unless you're eating or, or drinking. So at that, the Amos Fortune Forum is now...